Hello everybody, time for chapter three, Beneath God's Altar. Old Nell carried her false teeth around in her pocket. Our most eccentric neighbour, Nell, was often in trouble. Once my mother took her to Cork to visit a doctor and afterwards they went into the old Savoy for a meal. As soon as the waitress had placed the meal on the table, out came Nell's false teeth and into the ashtray. My mother never batted an eyelid and nobody would ever have known of this occurrence but for the fact that my sister, who was working in Cork at the time, had joined them, much to her regret. Why Nell bothered with the teeth at all was difficult to understand. She did not use them for eating and you had only to see her to know that, for her, appearance did not have a high priority. The truth of the matter was that she had paid good money for the teeth and regarded them rather like the new hat which she wore for special occasions. The fact that she, never, that she ever acquired them in the first place was entirely due to the considerable persuasive powers of the dentist, because making Nell part with her money was like prizing a stubborn barnacle from a rock. She was not short of money. She was the youngest of a large family who had all gone to America and done well, and as they did not have marrying blood in their veins, when they died, Nell was the beneficiary. She lived in a little house with a sagging thatched roof where birds nested and swallows gathered every year. The house itself was like a bird's nest and so overgrown with greenery that it was always dark inside. My father often tried to coax her to build a new house, but to her that was out of the question and she would not disturb the birds by repairing the old one. While things remained unchanged, my father often said that he hoped the house would last longer than Nell herself, and indeed it did. Few of the neighbours called on her, not because they did not want to, but because she did not want them to. She did not trust many people and preferred to keep to herself. Even when she called to our house, she would start screeching from about a field away. We heard her before we saw her. My father would raise his eyes to heaven and say, Nell is beagling again. She had a high-pitched, quarrelsome voice and she shouted to you whether you were in the same room as her or a field away. When she came, she was usually in a panic. The cows were after breaking out or the donkey was stuck in a hole or some other disaster had befallen her. And no matter what we were doing at the time, we had to drop everything to go to her rescue. Nevertheless, she was not in the least bit grateful for anything that was done for her. As far as she was concerned, virtue was its own reward. One day, my father spent a few particularly tough hours trying to repair her thatched roof without disturbing her birds or falling through it himself. When he had finished, she shouted out the door at him, You're dressing a bed in heaven for yourself! The implication was that he should be grateful to her for affording his soul such a golden opportunity. If you met Nell without being prepared for the shock, she would frighten the wits out of you. She had long black hair, which she never washed, and which was stiff with a combination of grease and soot. She had a straight black fringe, a little like Cleopatra's, except that Nell's was perfumed with smoke. A strange combination of dress and overall covered her from neck to ankles and down to her wrists. Her virgin skin never saw the light of day. She wore black knitted stockings and black leather boots laced above her ankles. Her face was almost as black as her hair, and if she happened to have her teeth in, they emphasised her overall blackness, because from lack of use, they were as pearly as the day the dentist gave them to her. When they were not in her mouth or her pocket, they were soaking in a jam pot on the dresser, the only bright spot grinning in the semi-darkness of the kitchen. I thought that Nell was a kindred spirit. Every day I called to her house and stayed there for hours. With that strange affinity which often develops between the very old and the very young, we were in perfect accord. She did not comply with normal acceptable adult behaviour, and in my eyes that brought her almost into my world, for to me she was more like a child than an adult. We went to town in the donkey and cart, and I was allowed to guide the donkey, who had a mind of his own, so we sometimes ended up in places far from where we had intended going. With Nell, I saw my first corpse. Some old woman who had gone to school with Nell had died many miles away, so we tackled up the donkey and set out. It was a lovely warm day, and as the donkey stopped for a feed of grass, whenever he got the notion, it took half the day to go and the other half to come back. When we arrived at the wake house, we were ushered into the room where the corpse was laid out. I had never before seen anybody dead, and it scared the daylights out of me. Whatever she'd been like in life, in death this old lady looked forbidding and aggressive. She was propped up in bed wearing a blue, high-necked frilled gown, and her abundant hair was swept high on her head. Her face was grey and rigid. She looked as if she had spent her life giving out, and that at any minute she might start again. 
I was glad when we made a hasty exit. Nell did not go in for social niceties, and so, without exchanging any formalities with the other mourners, we boarded our donkey and cart for the return journey. I was half nervous that the old lady might be coming after us. I looked back. Everybody at the wake was out on the road looking in our direction. Nell had not bothered to say who she was, and, as this was in a different parish, they had never seen her before. They probably thought that she was the devil. The only other regular caller to Nell's house was an old, half-blind man called Tim Joe. He lived further back the valley and brought her any news that he thought she should hear. It was he who had brought her the news of the old lady's death. Despite her lack of visitors, Nell decided that she would have the stations when her turn came. She was not expected to have them, but, contrary as she was, that was sufficient reason for Nell to do so. She sent word to all the neighbours via Tim Joe that she did not want them eating her out of house and home when they came, however. Undoubtedly, they got the message, for none of her neighbours were involved in Nell's stations or the preparations, apart from Tim, Joe and me. And, compared with what went on in other houses, there were almost no preparations at all. My mother worried more about Nell's stations than did Nell herself, but she was powerless to do anything, as Nell, when she put her mind to it, was as unyielding as steel. The colour of Nell's altar cloths and the lack of anything for the priest to eat caused my mother sleepless nights, but they did not cost Nell a thought. The day before the stations, Nell and I brushed the kitchen and threw out the ashes that sometimes accumulated if Nell did not get the urge to shift them. We whitewashed the inside walls and any parts of the outside not covered by ivy, and having washed out the floor and cleaned the windows, we thought the little place was a palace. Indeed, the cats and dogs that I put out for the clean-up were nearly afraid to come back in. After our strenuous efforts, Nell made tea, and, to my delight, produced a currant cake. But while we were having our tea party, she saw through the window a curious neighbour approaching, and straight away hid the cake behind a bucket of milk on the table. It was Nell's belief that it was more blessed to receive than to give. After the tea, down from the smoky rafters she took a timber box. Before we had time to open it, a brown mouse shot out between our fingers. His ancestors had probably moved in years previously and generations of his kin had been reared in the box. They were, of course, forced to live in such high places because of Nell's collection of cats, which now gave chase and put a sudden end to the long, undisturbed tenancy. There was plenty of evidence of the mouse family in the box, but apart from that and a few gigantic spiders, the box was a store of treasures. It contained some lovely old lace cloths and brass candlesticks. We shook out the cloths and discovered that they had some gaping holes. These, however, did not bother Nell, and she selected the two best ones to act as altar cloths. She had two hens hatching in boxes under the table, but she decided not to disturb them. Anyway, when it was covered by the white cloths, the hens disappeared from view. And though the cloth was not perfectly white after long years in the box, we thought that it was perfect and we also used the candlesticks, feeling no need to polish them. On the morning of the stations, I arrived before the priests to find that Nell had no fire lighting. She refused to light it, because the birds were not used to such an early fire, and she would not upset them. Such reasoning could not be argued with. The priests would be there for only one morning. The birds were always there. The parish priest was a kind, wise old man who, after evicting a few of Nell's cats from their warm bed, sat himself down on the chair beside where the fire should have been. The curate, Father Kelly, knew Nell well and had a good working relationship with her. He agreed with everything she said. As he set up his altar, I prayed that the hens would stay put and that he would not stand too close to the table, as one of them was very cross and could stick out her neck and bite. It was a peaceful sunny morning and the dogs lay asleep around the floor and the cats were curled up in the pool of sunlight on the doorstep. We had a heavenly choir as the birds chipped, chirped from their nests in the thatch and sang in the bushes and trees that grew wild and free close to the door. God smiled on us all that morning. It was a beautiful mass and I saw a tear slip down the face of the old priest. Suddenly, in the middle of the last blessing, the curate exclaimed with extra vehemence, Christ! The old priest nodded kindly, but I knew that the hatching hen had struck when I saw her head disappearing back through the folds of the altar cloth. Mass over, the problem of breakfast reared its ugly head. In order to boil the kettle, we had to light a fire, and lighting this fire was something of an ordeal. There was a hole under the open fire to create a draught, 
and the bellows lay just beside it to blow air into it. The problem was that ashes got into this hole and it had to be cleaned regularly, but Nell never cleaned it at all. Father Kelly decided to tackle the problem. He lit bits of newspaper and pushed them in under Nell's black turf. They flickered feebly and in order to encourage them, he went down on his hands and knees to blow at them. Unfortunately, Tim Joe chose that precise moment to turn the bellows, sending a shower of ashes over the head of the kneeling curate. Nell, who was chatting with the parish priest, or rather shouting at him, then solved the whole problem in two seconds by pouring a jam pot of paraffin oil on the fire and set it roaring up the chimney. In no time the kettle was singing, and Nell made tea as strong as porter. We boiled eggs in a black tin saucepan over the open fire, which was now glowing red and ideal for toasting bread. At last, the five of us sat down and had a companionable breakfast, during which the hatching egg hens decided that it was time to stretch their legs and trotted out the door, leaving evidence of their passage on the floor behind them. When Father Kelly saw them, a look of understanding came over his face and he smiled in amusement. Perhaps he had not realised until then that forces other than divine were under Nell's altar. When breakfast was over and we were relaxing in the sunny kitchen, Nell retired to her usual chair by the fire and after a few minutes sent out a loud snore. The priests took the hint. Their time was up. Nell was not accustomed to visitors and she had had enough for one day. I went to the gate with the two priests. The parish priest put his hand on my head and said, Little girl, God is found in strange places. Try not to forget this morning. I never did. Chapter 4 Animal Nanny In the farmyard, the gift of new life came with the spring. After Christmas, when we had celebrated the birth of the child Jesus, the baby calves were the first to arrive in the animal kingdom. We had watched the cows, heavy with calf, trampled daily through the winter mud. Indeed, I had sometimes witnessed the commencement of this saga in the coming together of the bull and cow. At night, the cows were tied up in the warm stalls on beds of yellow straw, and every night before going to sleep, my father lit the storm lantern to go and see them. The lantern was filled with oil and had a lighted wick surrounded by a glass globe, which protected it from the weather. This lamp hung from a long handle so that it could be carried comfortably by the hand. In checking the cows nightly, he had to be able to ascertain if any of them were going to calve during the night. He needed to be a bit of a gynaecologist, as an unattended cow could get into difficulty calving and the result might be a dead calf in the morning. Many a night he went out in the cold of winter to check. I loved to watch the baby calves arrive, though I hated to hear the cows groan in pain. However, like all mothers, they recovered quickly once it was over. The newborn calf was put under the mother's head and she licked it dry. Soon it stood on its spindly legs and wobbled round before being picked up and carried to the calf house where it was put in a section by itself. The cow, after a feed of warm bran, would be milked and the beastings, as this milk was called, fed to the calf. At this stage he was not quite sure how to drink, so you put your fingers into his mouth and he sucked the milk off them. The cow never again saw her calf, which seemed cruel to me, though it did not appear to bother her. The calves were kept in their house during the cold weather where they were fed, morning and evening, with buckets of milk warm from the cows. It was one of the first signs of summer when the calves were left out, and they were so accustomed to the limitations of house life that it took a lot of gentle persuasion to coax them into the bright sunlight. When we brought them through the haggard into a big green field, they could not believe their eyes. They spread their legs and put out their noses, expecting to meet a barrier. Then they took a couple of steps and tested with their noses again. They did this a few times until gradually it dawned on them that there were no more barriers. This was freedom. Then they took off, whipping their tails high into the air and galloping round the field with sheer abandon. Each night they were brought back to the farmyard to be fed. They drank from a communal trough and had to be watched closely or they would drink too much, as, like most teenagers, they still had to learn when to put the brakes on. One night I was supervising the feeding when one strong white-headed bull would not take his head from the trough despite all my efforts. Later on, while milking the cows, we heard a low bellow of pain coming from the haggard. My stubborn white head was prone on the ground with a swollen belly, his tongue hanging out and his eyes rolling in his head. Quick action was needed and my father pulled out his penknife and lanced the exact spot in the white head's belly. It receded like a balloon deflating and within minutes he was back on his legs. 
he had gone almost past the point of no return, and I viewed his recovery as if he were Lazarus rising from the dead. My father took on a new dimension in my eyes. <clears throat> as these calves grew older, they did not need to return to the farmyard for feeding, as they were able to eat sufficient grass for themselves. They were then kept in the fields, known as the inches, along by the river where they grew strong, and during the winter cold, when grass was scarce, hay was carried down to them. However, if the snow came, they had to be brought back up to the stalls for shelter. It was strange to see these calves, who but a few months previously had been nervous of open spaces, now terrified of the constraint of the stalls. When spring came, the large dung hills which had risen outside the cow houses, stables and piggery during the winter were drawn by horse and put to the fields, tilted out in heaps and spread to make the grass grow. This was the only fertiliser used on the land and on the drills of potatoes, mangles, turnips and cabbage. The land which had been ploughed in winter or early spring was now harrowed and drills made ready for setting. Setting the spuds was a big job. First, my father sorted out the seed potatoes and cut them into shkiolons, a section with an eye from which the new growth would sprout. On the day of the setting, we would each have a bucket of shkiolons, or a gallon if you were very small, and started setting at one end of the field. The drills stretched the whole length of a three or four acre field, and if you looked too far ahead, you could face that mental wall which long distance runners meet. We had a cheery character called Mick working with us on the farm, and he shortened many a long drill with his stories. His advice in these, or indeed many other circumstances, was to keep your head down, your arse to the wind, and keep going. If we were after having some wet weather, the earth would be damp and clammy, clinging to boots, knees and hands. We went on our knees to set potatoes, wrapping jute bags tied with binder twine around them. And as the day wore on, we were often weighed down with mud, which clung in lumps to boots and knees. And to add to the discomfort, our hands got colder and colder, while our noses were chilled enough to hang icicles from them. If we all got fed up at the same time, which could happen coming on evening, we would all sit down and Mick would sing a song. We learned many songs while setting spuds, and many a story was told, imaginary or otherwise. We understood well the story of the Gobon Sair, an old Irish legend. The Gobon Sair ruled a large kingdom which he wanted to leave to the cleverest of his three sons. One day he took his eldest son on a long journey, and after some time walking said, Son, shorten the road for me. The son was totally at a loss as to how to help his father, so they returned home. The following day, the Gobon Sair took his second son, and again the same thing happened. On the third day, he took his youngest son, and after they had travelled some distance, he said once more, Son, shorten the road for me. The youngest son immediately began to tell his father a story that was long and interesting, and they became so engrossed in the tale that they never noticed the length of the journey. In our lives, Mick was the Gobon Sayre's youngest son. When all the spuds were set, they were covered over with the dark brown earth, and even though we had suffered setting them, we felt a great sense of achievement the day the last drill was filled in. They stretched away into the distance, holding their secret growth within, and we knew every inch of that soft earth with the hidden stones that caused sharp pain when they came in contact with tender kneecaps. It would be difficult to be closer to the earth than we were. We also grew our own wheat, barley and oats. After ploughing and harrowing the land, the corn drill was used to sow the grain. The drill was a long timber box with a hinged cover, and into this the bag of seed was emptied. Underneath the box, were long slender pipes that fed the seeds into the earth in regular rows as the horse drew the corn drill along. When everything was planted it was in the hands of nature to provide the growth and it was wonderful to see the earth returning our trust when the bright green growth burst forth. In spring the land wakes up from its winter rest, the grass emerges, the buds begin to appear on the trees and the whole countryside loses its threadbare coat. The birds start to sing again telling us all that winter is over. The spring also brought to the young lambs. If there is anything that puts the closed sign on the door of winter, it is the sight of frisky lambs playing in the fields. Sometimes, if the EO decided that she was not designed for motherhood, a baby lamb would find its way into a box by the kitchen fire where it was bottle fed. Once, I had such a pet and I called him Sam. He was cared for lovingly and by early summer he had grown to be a big fellow, able to follow me everywhere. One day, while I was stooped forward playing in the garden, he came from behind and butted me with his head. I was very offended by this ingratitude, 
but it was evidence that Sam was ready to return to the flock. His pet days were over and he was letting me know in no uncertain terms. On the poultry side of the farm, the production cycle stretched across the summer months. In order to hatch chickens, a hen had to get the hatching urge, which motivated her to sit on a nest of eggs for three weeks. We had an old stone house at the end of the yard where rows of hatching hens sat in state in their boxes. They had to be fed and watered daily in the house because they all but refused to leave the nest. At the end of the three weeks, the chickens chipped their way out of the shells and when they emerged, they were soft and beautiful. The mother hen, or clucker as she was called, looked after her chicks with loving care and paraded around the farmyard leading her brood proudly. Sometimes too, a hen might lay her eggs in a remote corner of the haggard and hatch them unknown to anybody. Then one day she would march her chicks into the yard as if to say, look at me, aren't I clever? The turkeys, ducks and geese also hatched their eggs but took a week longer than the hens to do so. The goose liked to make her own nest and align it inside with soft down. The gander, for his part, was a most responsible father and guarded his goose on the nest. If you came too close, he flapped his wings and stretched out his long neck to bite you. The young goslings were fluffy and yellow as butter, and the goose and gander led them daily to the water where they all washed and swam around happily. But the males in the turkey and hen families were irresponsible fathers. Once they had made their original contribution, they disclaimed all responsibility for the consequences. Great care had to be taken of the baby turkeys as they were a bit stupid, and unlike the chickens, and goslings had a tendency to get lost. The goose was a very good mother and she had a strong family unit working for her. The ordinary hen was the head of a one-parent family, but her mothering instinct was fantastic. The turkey, on the other hand, had neither factor going for her. She was on her own and she was not unduly concerned about the well-being of her young. She needed a strong social welfare system to back her up and, of course, we provided that. Minding the turkeys was one of the chores of my young days. When they were set loose in a grassy field, which was supposed to be good for them, I was the social welfare officer who saw that none of them fell by the wayside. They had endless ways of going wrong. If they fell on their backs, they could not right themselves. They could ramble off through the long grass and, with no sense of direction, get totally lost, and their mother would never bother to answer their plaintive peep peep. I liked this job because it was leisurely and did not require a great deal of concentration, so I could take a book along with me. Sitting on the warm grass on a sunny day reading was a pleasant way to while away the time, though occasionally I would forget what I was actually there for and would have to make a mad scramble to collect lost turkeys from all over the field. A common enemy of all the young chicks was the hawk. He would circle around in the sky observing and then he would make a sudden dive swooping down on the chicks and soar off with one grasped in its taloned feet. He was accurate and deadly. The old hens were wise to his ways and if they saw him circling they cackled and set up a loud noise to alert us to the danger. We always came running to the rescue and clapped our hands at the hawk but sometimes it took my father's shotgun to frighten him away. When I was very young I dreaded the hawk because I had visions of soaring skywards myself caught in his fearsome talons. The farmyard was a symphony of colour and sound. The hens were multicoloured because they consisted of many breeds. There were Rhode Island Reds, the black and Renorca with the golden beak, the white leghorn and the frilly Sussex with her two white aprons giving her the appearance of a head nurse. Once they had produced their eggs, they did not believe in hiding their light under a bushel, so they came out of the door of the hen house emitting a high-pitched cackling noise, telling everybody about their good deed for the day. The black turkeys gave off a continuous yodelling sound, the grey guinea fowl a single high-pitched clucking noise. We had the brown ducks with their ringed necks, and the soft-bosomed voluptuous white ducks with their constant quack-quack. The geese seldom stayed around the yard as they preferred the open fields and waterways, but they came back at night to their own house. If they had stayed out, the fox would have had a Christmas dinner every night. There was seldom a fight between the different families on the farmyard as each one went its own way. If there was a fight, it would be between the sow and the gander. The sow was not averse to thinking that a soft yellow gosling made a tasty mouthful, but before she could put her bad thoughts into action, the gander, with outstretched flapping wings and with a sharp beak aimed at the sow's delicate snout and eyes, drove her squealing in the opposite direction. Most of the new life on the farm arrived in the spring and early summer and almost all the births fitted into the ordinary farm proceedings. But the pig was not tied to any calendar and her bonham's arrival disrupted the normal routine. She was the one mother who required round-the-clock surveillance 
because she was quite capable of lying down on her baby banners and crushing them to death. This sounds as if the mother pig was a monster, but how many mothers could cope with 20 babies at one go? It was enough to stretch even the strongest maternal instincts. The hen was the only other to come near her in number and she had just about had a dozen. As well as that, the hen hatched while sitting in comfort on her eggs for three weeks, while the poor old sow had the ordeal of labour pains and the messy job of physical production, and then finished up with 20 squealing bonhams which she was expected to breastfeed. It was a tough job, and it was no wonder if sometimes she felt like sitting on them. When the bonhams were due, the sow started to make a bed wherever she happened to be. She was put into a little house by herself with plenty of straw or hay, and proceeded to chop up the straw with her mouth and tease it out with her crew beans. She kept working on the bed until she had everything arranged and her nesting instinct satisfied. Finally, she settled down and got on with the real business of the day. The litter of pretty pink bonhams could vary from 12 to 20 in number, and if there were more than the sow could cater for, they had to be bottle-fed. When it was feeding time, the sow grunted with a loud, regular rhythm, and all her little ones got the message straight away. Between fields they lay, feeds, they lay cuddled up together against the mother. The need for supervision came when the sow got up and had to be let out for a walk, or just wanted to stretch her legs, for when she returned to lie down, she never checked to see where her bonhams were. She just flopped down, and if they were in the wrong place, she lay on them and killed them. In fairness to the sow, with the best intentions in the world, it was impossible to keep her big brood out from under her legs. This was where we came in, using a brush to get the bonhams out of the way quickly. The bonhams learned fast, and after a few days they could look out for themselves, but while they were very small, somebody had to stay up at night to mind them. The first time I was ever allowed up with an older sister to mind the bonhams was of a Friday night, as we had no school on Saturday. I was delighted, because I was curious to know what a night up was like. At that time we had a big open fireplace in the kitchen, and we banked it up with turf for the night. The sow only required checking at regular intervals, so, apart from that, our time was our own. We played cards and made an apple tart. At about two o'clock I sat on the old sofa by the blazing fire, and must have dozed off because the next time I heard the clock strike it was four in the morning. It was midsummer and the dawn was breaking when I went out into the garden. It was bathed in a pink translucent light and a soft mist lay along the river valley. I was mesmerised by the absolute beauty of the morning and the dawn chorus in full volume from the trees around the house. It was one of those rare moments of perfection that are imprinted in the memory forever. Sloan.